It's okay, perfect. So my name's Eric. I'm one of the hard that I actually uh, gave this talk to some med students before. So from a standpoint of disclosures, no financial or non-financial relationships to disclose, but it's not because I don't try, maybe one day. Um, so background questions. I know uh, the last speaker took a lot of time talking about all this stuff. Um, so I'm gonna go by really quickly. Uh, what's my story? Born and raised in Los Angeles, went to UCLA, spent 10 years in Chicago, did med school, business school, general surgery residency, came to UF. Um, in Gainesville, which is a little bit different from LA and Chicago, just a little bit, um, and um, did cardiac surgery. And um, the plan was always to go back to California, but sometimes you get offers you can't refuse. So that's me. Um, I do heart surgery. Um, I'm board certified in general and general surgery and cardiac surgery. Um, and how I chose that, I, I've been I've been pretty good with my hands like forever, um, and I didn't really know if I could do. Um, if so, I, I gravitated towards surgery. Um, initially, and many of you may not know that there is a difference: the medicine doctors and the surgery doctors. Um, there are other fields like anesthesia, dermatology, um, uh, radiology, things like that. But the general um, bifurcation is medicine and surgery. Um, where medicine, you do a lot more diagnosing and treating with medicines, and surgery, you do surgery. Um, so I think uh, how I chose that, I ended up. Um, I think I was tricked as a small child to, to become a doctor, and uh, it happened to be the right move. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, but it just did. Um, what do I like and dislike? I think um, <clears throat> I really, again, I, I think it's the most perfect field for me, um, how I got here. Um, probably a lot of dumb luck, um, but it's the most perfect field for me. Um, lifestyle, it's not that bad. I mean, I, I like work, so going to work is kind of like um, fun. <laughs> And so when I'm operating, I'm actually a lot less, um, I'm a lot, I'm actually a lot more happy when I'm operating than when I'm not operating. So otherwise, um, you know, I'm just doing other random stuff. Um, family, I have a wife, two kids, three kids, one on the way. Um, so I do have family. Um, it's typical, typical compensation. You get paid a lot as a cardiac surgeon, um, like a lot. Um, you know, they, they say, I know they gave numbers earlier and if I gave you numbers you would, it would just seem ridiculous um, so the median salary in Gainesville is somewhere around 20 something thousand I don't know how they a lot of people survive on that but we probably make more than 20 or bring home more than 20 something thousand in a month um, so from a standpoint of what does a day in my life look like uh, I happen to be not operating today I, I've actually forgot that I signed up for this um, and uh, so it was actually good that when I woke up this morning we had a couple meetings and I saw my calendar um, that um, I had this on so <laughs> I was lucky um, so what should people consider if we're going into the profession I think um, medicine I mean some people think they want to be doctors right off the bat I, again I didn't know I think my parents tricked me um, and it just so happened that I got there um, I think when I was at UCLA at undergrad um, after third year, I got into med school already, and um, this was 2000, it seems like a long time ago, but this was 2004 or five. Uh, and um, I was telling my dad, my brother was in med school, and my, I, I told my dad, maybe I should do investment banking. And he said, no. So I said, okay. And that's how I continued on the path to medicine. Um, so what do I think about my career 10 to 15 10 years down the road? They say surgeons operate. I mean, I think I'm going to continue to grow as a surgeon. Uh, I, I don't think you can operate forever. Um, that being said, there has to always be a plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, I do have my MBA and um, maybe considering medicine and things like that, investing, whatnot is, um, is a good idea. Um, how do I cope with or per prevent burnout? I think if you really like your job, um, you won't burn out. If, you, if you're doing something you don't like, it's easy to burn out. Um, so that's that. I know the last speaker spent a lot of time on that, but what I'm going to do is we're just going to talk about cardiac surgery, and I think it's important just to give you an overview of kind of what we do, why we do it, things like that. So um, this, again, this was based on a lecture I gave to med students. We're going to talk about cardiac anatomy, discuss uh, heart attacks, and describe management strategies for valvular dysfunction, and understand heart failure. Um, 
So gross anatomy of the heart. This is this is a heart. It it actually does look like this. So it's actually a. I mean the blue the blue is a little bit darker shade of blue, but it is actually blue, and this is the heart. So basically, um, when you're looking at this, your your you can see my cursor. So blood comes back to your superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, enters your right atrium, goes to your tricuspid valve. Um, the right ventricle squeezes, enters the pulmonary, uh, right ventricular outflow tract, uh, goes through the pulmonary valve, enters the pulmonary arteries, goes to the lungs. The lungs oxygenate and um, exchange uh, O2 and CO2, comes back through the pulmonary veins, enters the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve, the left ventricle squeezes, passes the aortic valve, feeds the coronaries, and feeds your entire body. So your brain, brain vessels, and arms, and whatnot. So that's how blood flows in your system. So deoxygenated blood comes to your right heart. Uh, lungs oxygen and the left heart sends it out to the body. So this is valvular anatomy. So you have four, generally, if you have a normal heart, you have four valves. So your aortic valve is the center of everything, right? So your aortic valve is the, uh, the smallest valve and it is actually in the center of all the other valves. Um, <clears throat> so this is the aortic anatomy. So after, so the heart was right here and then you have your coronary arteries that come off first and then you have these blood vessels this is your aorta. <clears throat> this is your innominate artery. It branches to your subclavian, your right subclavian, and right carotid. Then you have your left carotid, and then you have your left subclavian. So your brain is actually, uh, and this is the extent of my of my brain um, brain blood flow neurosurgery. Your brain is basically supplied by four vessels: your carotids on the front, and then your vertebrals on the back. So who's paying attention? Uh, so what are the first branches of the aorta? Um, it's actually, uh, many people will say the nominate artery, but it's actually the left and right coronaries. That's the first thing that come off, right? Um, so coronary anatomy, it's important because your heart is fed by these blood vessels that are usually about one millimeter in, in size. So not one centimeter, but one millimeter. If you think about that, we're bypassing one millimeter vessels and that's pretty hard. It's actually probably the most technically difficult operation we do, um, but um, people take it for granted because um, it's it's predictable and you do it so often. So a lot of the stuff we do at UF Shands is is complex, complex stuff. And when we're doing coronaries, it's usually because they're, they're sent to us from another hospital or another cardiologist because some surgeon out there in the world doesn't want to do it. And they, they don't send you gifts, they send you bad gifts. Um, so what is a heart attack? A heart attack is when <clears throat> basically you have blockages in the heart. So what causes blockages, um, high cholesterol, <coughs> ongoing hypertension that leads to lipid plaques and, and causes blockages in, the, in, in your blood vessels. So these can be caused by gradual narrowing uh, just by, um, by your lipids and whatnot, or you can have some embolic phenomenon that causes an acute occlusion. So heart attacks are separated by two different, two, two main categories, and you'll hear this a lot. Um, it's called a STEMI, which is a ST elevation uh, myocardial infar infarction, or a N STEMI. Uh, and again, this is usually um, uh, usually determined by the etiology of the equation. Usually, if you have a STEMI, you have this acute occlusion, and what you want to do is you want to open up the coronaries uh, within 90 minutes, um, and that way you decrease the amount of heart muscle you lose. In uh, in a similar manner, the, the strokes are similar too, right? So it's like an acute occlusion or bleed in the brain. And the, the difference between brain and heart is that you can actually make the heart a lot better. And if you have an acute occlusion of your brain vessels, sometimes um, your brain doesn't work so good. So um, that's bad. So what are the symptoms of a heart attack? Um, you get chest pain. Everybody's a little bit variable. Some people complain of an elephant sitting on their chest. Some people complain about radiating to their arms. So you get headaches. You get a various amount of symptoms. Even people think they're having COVID or something just by these symptoms. But you know, it's just highly variable. Um, so what is the initial strategy? A lot of people say Mona, and that just means morphine. It, it controls the pain, you give them oxygen, so you provide um, optimal oxygen carrying capacity in the, in the blood cells that are going through the heart. You give nitroglycerin, it vasodilates the heart, helps control blood pressure, helps control your uh, perfusion of the heart, and then aspirin to make the platelets a little bit less um, work less well, so therefore more blood can go through. 
So we're going to think about acute coronary syndrome, so a heart attack. You're wondering about what you should do, and a lot of people think about this. So one of the things they say is get an EKG. It's actually, uh, so EKG is based on like the, uh, it, it's obviously ECG, but everybody calls it EKG. It doesn't really matter. Whatever it is, it's a strip that um, basically you're monitoring how the heart's doing, how your rhythm of your heart is basically what the EKG is telling you. And what it does is it explain, it kind of gives you predictors of if the, if the heart attacks on the anterior wall, the lateral wall, the inferior wall, where the problem is. Um, and again, there's ST elevation versus non-ST elevation and all of them lead you to um, thinking what should you do. And a lot of times if you're having a heart attack, then you should probably get a cath to see what you can do about it. Um, so what are the interventions? So everybody um, knows about stents. So PCI, it's called percutaneous intervention. It means that they go into your arteries, uh, find the little blockages and either put a balloon up there to open up the space or put a stent in um, or coronary bypass surgery. So this picture is a picture of basically grabs. So we take vein and our, our artery and put them actually literally bypass, like provide a detour route to the to the block vessels and what the difference between the two is mainly um if you have three vessel um, multi-vessel disease or left main equivalent meaning you have a, a a blockage in your left main the coronary bypass is the gold standard you have less interventions last longer uh, and more proven symptoms so all those things suggest that coronary bypass is better um so how do we diagnose an MI? So we diagnose an MI by getting EKG, you get labs. So you draw people's blood and you get uh, things called troponins. And that tells you how, um, it gives you a marker of um, the cardiac enzymes that are released. And then there's a thing called CKMB. So there's different labs you can get. Uh, you get an EKG, it tells, tells you if the rhythm's all messed up or where you have an infarct or, and then you get an echo. What is an echo? An echo is basically an ultrasound of the heart. So the ultrasound of the heart, what it does is it tells you about the function of the heart. So a normal function of a heart is about uh, 55 to 65% ejection fraction. You would think it's 100%, but it's not. So your heart beats, uh, uh, perfuses about 55 to 65%, and that's normal. Um, and then it tells you about the valvular abnormalities that could be possibly happening. In addition, you should get a cath. A cath is basically an angiogram, which is basically shooting some dye into your coronaries to help you understand if there's blockages in your coronaries. Because if there are blockages, you want to do something about it. Why can an, what, what exactly is it about a, a heart attack that hurts you? So if you don't have good blood, blood flow to your heart, your heart doesn't beat nothing gets perfused, you die. Um, that's basically what it is. Um, sometimes it's it's a slower version of that. Sometimes your heart doesn't get perfused. Um, you go into shock, meaning you're not you're, you're not giving your body enough blood flow, your organs are dying off slowly. Sometimes it's you don't have enough blood flow to one area of the heart and then all of a sudden you're uh, one of your uh, papillary muscles rupture and then all of a sudden your your valves start malfunctioning. It could be that um, you kill off a portion of your heart and then there becomes um, a hole in your heart because a part of your heart dies. So there's a lot of ways to die from a, a heart attack. It's not, um, but the great, the, the best thing when you think about a heart attack versus a stroke is that you could actually fix something. Uh, not, uh, not to say anything bad, bad about neurosurgeons, they're necessary and amazing and stuff, but sometimes um, getting a great result from, from a stroke is a little bit tougher, right? Because a heart attack, you can recover muscle a little bit easier. So like I was saying earlier, this is a cross-section view of the heart. So if you look at this picture, it's basically cut directly in the middle, and then you can see that the aortic valve, again, is the center of all of everything. <clears throat> so when you think about valves, um, they can have, this is what a, a normal valve looks like. The le valve leaflets are actually just like almost tissue paper. And it's amazing that they function actually. So when you think about a valve, you think about it like a door or a window. So the door can, the door can fail or window can fail in two ways. It can be either stenotic, meaning the door doesn't open well, or it can be hypermobile. So it opens too well and all of a sudden you're leaking. You only want these valves to work one way. And if they, if they number one, if they don't open very well, they're stenotic, they fail like that, or they're leaking really bad and they fail. So those are the reasons what, what those are the main problems that happen with heart valves. 
So when do you intervene and what valves you intervene on? You can intervene on any of those valves. Um, and if they're regurgitant or stenotic, that's when you intervene or it's leading to heart failure type of symptoms. Um, other reasons to intervene are endocarditis. Um, endocarditis, and if you've seen the news and whatnot, the, the um, what do they call it? the opiate, the opiate um, problem is um, really bad. And we, we do see a lot of young people that are doing drugs and all of a sudden they have these big vegetations on their heart and uh, uh, vegetations are just like um, platelet aggregate and infection that just deposits onto your valves and then it just sends it off all over your body. Um, so I, last week I operated on a guy, he's about 25 years old, had a couple strokes because he was doing drugs. Um, so this is my don't do drugs talk. Um, he's doing drugs and um, basically had this three centimeter vegetation on his mitral valve sending off stuff to his brain causing strokes. And so I cut out, I cut out his valves made him better um, and he's doing good and he's uh, he's awake and um, and doing well. The only problem is that um, it is a, I'd say it's a terminal condition. It, some people actually get better because they go to substance abuse programs and they completely change their lives. But if they don't, usually um, not a lot of people are willing to reoperate on druggies and that's not because we don't think druggies deserve a chance they already got a chance so usually you get one chance at it and if if you don't um, um if you don't get with the program you're gonna die no matter what um again i operate on another lady she's about 20 years old bad endocarditis also her whole right heart was filled with infection i had to replace her tricuspid valve she agreed to a substance abuse program and i spent like an hour trying to convince her to go to substance abuse program if she wants to go home she's probably gonna go home and do drugs uh, and that's just the unfortunate scenario um, that's just what it is so what are the type of valves that you can replace with? This is kind of a figure of all the different valves there are. So there's tissue valves. These are made out of either um, either porcine or bovine pericardium, the, por the por uh, pig valves or cow valves, um, or mechanical valves. These aren't metal. They say they're called mechanical valves, but they're not metal. There's some sort of carbon material. So uh, the benefits of each, the mechanical valve, um, it lasts forever. It's supposed to last 100 years, and we don't have a lot of patients living more than 100 years. And so uh, mechanical valves are great in that, but you have to be on anticoagulation, meaning you have to be on blood thinners. Tissue valves are great because you don't have to be on blood thinners, um, but they have a finite lifespan, meaning they, you can, they work for about 10 to 15 years. The next question, what happens in 10 to 15 years? You usually have to have an intervention. Um, prior to having transcatheter valves, which are these valves in the third row, um, the, the next intervention would be reoperative surgery. And we do that all the time. Um, but now that there's transcatheter options, this transcatheter means that we go through the arteries and deploy these valves into either a stenotic valve or previously placed valves. And that's a great option nowadays. And so people that, let's say you wanted to operate on a 65 year old and you don't want to put them on blood thinners, more likely than not, they're going to live past 80. And so what are you going to do? You put in a good valve that lasts 15 years, and then you can put a transcatheter valve in into that valve. So that's a great option nowadays. <clears throat> so when we're talking about uh, one of the main valves that we operate on the most with is the aortic valve. Again, I told you it's the central valve. It, it gives off your, cor it's the valve right before your coronaries, your, the, the aorta, the blood vessel that sends everything to your whole body. So if you have severe aortic stenosis, so valve area of less than one centimeter, so what happens is that um, <clears throat> it actually changes your life expectancy. So you're a lot, if you have severe aortic stenosis and angina, uh, your life expectancy is five years. If you have severe aortic stenosis and syncope, meaning you're passing out, you have a life expectancy of three years. And if you have severe aortic stenosis and heart failure symptoms, meaning shortness of breath, then your life expectancy is two years, which kind of sucks. Actually, when you tell people this, they're like, please fix my valve. I mean, it's just what it is. Um, so how do we decide what kind of valve? I think it depends on the patient's age, their lifestyle, their timing of operation, the comorbidities. I mean, you get some people that are super young, like 20 something, 30 years old. And um, for some reason, their valve sucks. And you said, okay, maybe you should get a mechanical valve because you want it to last forever. 
Um, because if you think about it, if someone's 20 or 30 in 15 years, they're only gonna be 35. And then you buy another eight to 10 years with a transcatheter valve, they're only gonna be 40 something. So in those patients, you would think a mechanical valve is the best option. However, some people, I mean, some people like skydiving. If you like skydiving or rock climbing, maybe you shouldn't be on blood thinners because um, the repercussions of an accident are, are huge. I mean, I guess if you skydive, and you have an accident, you're kind of hosed no matter what you are, but um, it's just what it is. <clears throat> so we're talking about one of the things that I do is that I put in pumps in people. So I put in machines and hearts. Sounds kind of cool because it is, and that's kind of why I like my job. Um, and I put in, I do a lot of transplant. I, I do every heart surgery you could think of, but I do, uh, I'm the main guy that puts in uh, mechanical circulatory support devices and heart transplants. So in talking about heart failure, everybody, <clears throat> everybody may know somebody that has heart failure or something about heart failure, but it is actually one of the most major drivers of morbidity and mortality in the U.S. <clears throat> It's a growing issue. About 6 million people in the U.S. have heart failure and over half a million people are diagnosed each year. It's actually the most number one reason for hospitalizations in people over 65. And after four hospitalizations, your median survival is actually less than six months. Imagine telling somebody, yeah, you've been hospital, hospitalized um, four times this year. I think you're not going to live more than six months. I mean, that's a rough conversation, right? Um, so <clears throat> everybody likes to, everybody is fascinated with cancer. Everybody wants to cure cancer, but um, it actually, heart failure actually has a mortality similar to many aggressive malignancies. Everybody knows about lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, right? So pancreatic cancer, one year survival is like less than, uh, here it says like 85%, but one year mortality is 85%, but it's somewhere around 90%. Lung cancer is somewhere 65 to 70%. So in heart failure, one year mortality is, is uh, 80%. So it's huge. So um, uh, it is actually closely aligned with a lot of cancers. So when you're thinking about the, the problems with it. So what do you do about heart failure? There are medical options and there's surgical options. Again, it comes back to who the medical doctors are and the surgical doctors. So a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon are very different. Uh, cardiologists are very nice people. I have a lot of friends that are cardiologists. Um, and so but there is a difference. Um, cardiologists are, cardi are medicine doctors and uh, surgeons are surgeons. Everybody, usually it's either you have an MD or a DO or, some, or something like that, but um, medicine doctors focus on the medicine aspect of things and surgical doctors focus on surgery. Um, <clears throat> um, but we can do everything the medicine doctors do. And I'm not gonna say but better, but <laughs> we, we do everything that they can do. Um, so med med medical management uh, or lifestyle change changes. So if you're smoking a lot, you should quit smoking. If you weigh 500 pounds, you should do something to um, to have weight loss, either be on a diet program or have bariatric surgery. Other options are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, uh, beta blockers, statins, and inotropes. So um, <clears throat> we know all these medical options and I'm going to be on the next slide that they actually help lot in survival. What are the surgical options? So you can put pacing pacers in. Usually the pacers are placed by the EP doctors who are also cardiologists, or you can do coronary artery bypass, which is a cardiac surgery thing. You can do uh, surgical remodeling surgery, or you can do transplants or ventricular assist devices. So this is what I was talking about. So beta block. So this is why actually scientists and research and all that stuff is so important because um, you can see here that beta blockers have had a relative risk reduction of a lot, ACE inhibitor statins and ICD same. So we could see that it, it's actually saved a lot of people when you're talking about um, <clears throat> cardiac deaths um, with these interventions. So, so um, when you're thinking about heart failure, um, what happens when you've used all your medical options? What are you gonna do? Um, some people start praying and some people start trying to figure out what else they can do, right? So surgeons are usually called to the uh, forefront when you need something more than medicine, right? So if you have um, a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 25%, uh, you have NYHA class 3B to 4, 4 you're either inotrope dependent or non-inotrope dependent, the gold standard, so the best thing that you can offer patients is a heart transplant. So um, <clears throat> the operative mortality is about 5%, and the one-year survival is 85 to 90%. 
Um, so how long, let's say someone needs a heart transplant, how long are they going to live? Usually the median survival is about a decade, a little, bit over, a little bit over nine years. So if you get a heart transplant, you'll probably survive a decade, but we do have people out 25 plus years. So it just depends on uh, the patient when they get transplanted um, and whatnot. So some congenital cases survive a long time, and then some of them are even retransplanted. So what is the problem that, so it's always a supply and demand issue, right? So whenever you think about business or any marketplace thing, it, it, it's defined by supply and demand, right? So uh, because there's so much more um, demand than there is supply, so 20,000 people need hearts every year and only 2,000 people get it. Um, that suggests that 90% of the people that need hearts don't get it. And therefore you have an excess, excess um, demand and a, and a severe shortage in supply. So what was uh, <clears> the <throat> what was what, what was the solution? Well, you, there's total artificial hearts and ventricular cyst devices. In 1969, this this gentleman Denton Cooley, who was actually supposed to be the greatest heart surgeon on the planet at that time <clears throat> in Texas and the Texas Heart Institute, is Baylor and then the Texas Heart Institute. Um, he said, within a few months, this is 1969, within a few months, <clears throat> we'll have these assist devices on operating room shelves. But the reality is that <clears throat> after all that research, even though that, that research was initiated in 1965, he barely started clinical implants in 1995. So not that long ago, 30 years ago, right? 30 years from when they thought it was going to happen. And actually this, when I interviewed in, um, when I interviewed at Texas Heart, they actually, it was great. He was, Denton Cooley has subsequently died, but um, they did a great job marketing everything. They gave, they gave me a book. He wrote a he wrote a little note and gave us a picture. They fed us Texas barbecue. It was amazing. It was, that was a great marketing ploy though. And so it works. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about heart failure. So when you're thinking about it, I just told you like 80% um, of the people that have heart failure and those symptoms will die within one to two years. So is that bad? Yes. Um, so what what do you do? So what did they do? So they first started with uh, LVAD heart, HeartMate XVE. So the HeartMate XVE is actually a pulsatile ventricular cyst device, because what they thought was uh, nature has it right. Let's tr let's mimic nature, right? So they did that, <clears throat> and then what they found was. Um, when they compared the two groups, so optimal medical management means ionotrope therapy and every, everything medicine known to man without an LVAD. What they found was at one year, you had a 51 to a 28% survival, which is double, right? And then again, almost triple the amount of survival at two years. So optimal medical therapy, you, you went, at one year, you were living 28% of the time and at two years, you were living 10% of the time versus 51 and 27. So that clearly showed that um, these devices could help people. Right, because if you can say I could double your lifespan, people are going to say, "Yeah, please." Right. Um, <clears throat> then what happened was that they, they, uh, this gentleman from Louisville um, was one of the first author who published this. They, the second generation device was the was the HeartMate Two. It's a continuous flow device. What they found with the pulsatile devices was that it was big, clunky, and not a lot of people could. Um, it could be implanted a lot of people because there were size restrictions. So they, they made a smaller device um, and then they compared the, the pulsatile to the non-pulsatile devices, right? Because that's, you already know the pulsatile devices are better. So if you can compare your new group with a group that's already better, you can try to understand what's going to happen. And what they found here was that Number one, um, the, the continuous flow devices were working better. Number two, they had better quality of life. So now we know that continuous flow LVADs are better than post-style LVADs. So we're at the second generation VAD. <clears throat> this is the most recent generation VAD. It's the HeartMate 3. It's the picture right here. It, it's actually the size of your hand, probably a little bit less than your hand. Um, and then it lives in the pericardium, so completely within the heart. Um, and what they found was that these, these patients are living 80% of the 80 at 80 plus percent at two years. So um, you went from surviving 10 to 20% at one to two years to 50% to 70% to 80 plus percent. So um, if you tell anybody that if, if they're in that position, what happens is that they end up deciding that they want a bad. We're actually the busiest center in the state of Florida and also um, 
probably the southeast. So this is the HeartMate HeartMate XVE big device. So um, it's it's huge, and not a lot of people. I mean, if you're really skinny, where are you going to put that? Right? It's all supposed to be on the inside. You have to find a place to put it. The HeartMate 2 was also big, but not as big as the Pulsatile device. The HVAD is a is a is a, is like a 2.5 generation VAD, and then the HeartMate 3. They have, what they had was the MVAD, which is one of the things that they're working on and like HeartMate 4 slash HeartMate 5, whatever it is that they're coming up with. And those are newer generation VADs that are supposed to improve everything. One of the bad things with these VADs is that they have to be, there, there is a drive line. So even though the device is completely inapplicable, you get this like telephone um, or like power cord like thing coming out of your your abdomen and you kind of have to be powered. That's kind of the worst thing. You have to be on anticoagulation. You have to be powered. You can't, you can't go swimming. You can't take a bath, but you can shower and you have to, you have to um, keep it not wet because if you imagine getting it wet, it's probably a bad idea. That being said, I've had a patient that went in to save a kid, jumped into a pool to save a kid that was drowning, came out and his dad was still working. That's great. I think it depends on whose kid it is though. <laughs> um, wouldn't, wouldn't be advised to jump in a pool. Um, that being said, so when you're thinking about everything, um, it's never about one person, right? Everybody thinks, oh, uh, when you're, when you're getting surgery, you're like, oh, the heart surgeon, the heart surgeon is so important. And I'd like to think that, but the reality is that there is, um, there's a lot of components, right? So there's cardiologists, there's physical therapists, there's pharmacists, there's psychiatrists, nutritionists. There's all these people that are involved in making this happen. And uh, the key is that no matter what you're doing, as long as you understand you're a component of a team, they'll probably work better in your favor. Um, yeah, so teamwork is kind of important. And so, like the last speaker was saying, there's a you, you find that there's a lot of mentors when you're thinking about things. These are a couple of my mentors. Um, well, actually, when I came to interview at UF, again, this was my last interview. I went on like 19 interviews. Um, and then this gentleman, Dr. Staples, who works at the VA, he's like tall guy. He's like 6'5 or 6'6 six, six or something like that. Super tall guy. I'm like 5'8. Um, and he sits there in my interview. He's like, have you seen Edo? Edo is like like your hair, the, the, the thickness of your hair. Have you seen Edo? I was like, no, sir. I'm a general surgery resident. Uh, no, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to teach you how to sew with Edo. I was like, Jesus, this is intense. And then, um, Dr. Stinson, I mean, he, he's, he's also works at the VA. I mean, he's, he's taught me a lot. He's taught me that, you know, when you, when you want to do things, you should plan it. I mean, you plan it and then you come and you execute your plan. You don't, you don't come with, no plan and then just dilly dally around and because that's bad for heart surgery when you think about it like i mean you want your heart surgery one one perfusionist once told me um eric it because we're talking about different surgeons and whatnot and he's like eric sometimes it's not good enough to be just okay and they weren't talking about me <laughs> so i mean that, that's true right if you're the patient that if you're the patient you expect your heart surgeon to be pretty damn good. Bly Weiss is the congenital surgeon here at UF. And I mean, he, he leads pretty much by example. And I mean, he, he's, he's ta taught me that it's okay if you want to be perfect. Uh, but you know, you can't, you can't beat on people. I mean, again, it's a whole team, right? So sometimes you're striving to prefer perfection, but people can only take so much beatings <laughs> per day. So you got to like balance that out. Um, <clears throat> When I came here, Dr. Martin, who's actually uh, my friend, probably the most senior surgeon here right now, and um, um, the, the director of the aortic center, uh, he, he told me actually, uh, when I came for my interview, we interviewed at the cardiac surgery office. He's like, if you come here, I'll take a gator hunt. We still haven't been gator hunting. And then he left me for about three years <laughs> during my fellowship. So that kind of sucked. And then um, Dr. Beaver, who's the chief of cardiac surgery, I mean, he, he hired me, he convinced me that I wanted to stay somehow. Um, and, you know, we, we learn together every day and we, we know that um, as long as you're learning every day, it's kind of a good thing. But this is my family. Oh, that's my family. Where is that? So my son left corner, that's a little bit older picture of him, he's 10. 
my daughter, um, my two daughters. So she's eight now and she's three. So that's a little bit of older picture. And then, but behind every great man is an even greater woman. And that's my wife. That's a little bit older picture. Um, but behind every man is just the woman rolling her eyes. And that's usually makes her laugh. But, uh, marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right. And the other is usually me. And that is it. Any questions or concerns? Are you able to look at the chat at all and open it up? Yeah, let me figure that out. There might be a bar at the top with like three dots that says more and then chat would be under that. Or if you stop screen sharing, it's easier to see. Okay, I'm gonna try to do that. and close the window oh here stop share genius okay perfect where are we at i went fast that's good go fast at everything um where do i start um if you scroll up alexander at eleven twenty-four, he was the first question Twenty. Okay, it says eleven twenty-five. I'm just kidding. Uh, you mentioned you have surgical and non-surgical days uh, during the course of your work week. How much time is spent operating? So I oper I try to operate every day. Uh, again, it, it, I'm not supposed to operate on my clinic days, which is Tuesday, and I did two cases yesterday. Um, so it just depends. It depends on what comes in. I mean, you you can't predict. It. It sometimes I mean you get dissections all the time sometimes one weekend I was I did like a dissection and then we finished the dissection and then another dissection was coming and then we thought we were in the clear after we finished that one and then another one came so you know you, you never know what's going to happen I mean usually bad things happen in threes and so um, that's what it is um, do you think that uh, this branch of medicine is less patient oriented point of that? Um, I think surgery, and I'm biased, I think surgery is the best bang for your buck. Um, why that is, is because I, I actually think general surgery, so I'm a cardiac surgeon, but I did five years of general surgery. Um, I think I think that um, if you're a general surgeon, you can basically take care of anything comes, that comes to the door. So I did my training in Chicago and people get shot left and right. And it's kind of crazy. Um, it's bad for patients, but it's great for training. Um, <clears throat> and so what, what happens is that you learn that you can take care of anything, anything that comes to the door, you can take care of, which is, is amazing. It's an amazing feeling to have, right? So someone's super sick, you can make them better, or at least you can try to and give them the best shot, but not everybody's created equal. You'll find that um, all, not all surgeons are created equal, not all students are created equal, it's just what it is. People bring their strengths and weaknesses to um, their fields. What is my favorite surgical procedure? Uh, any heart case, really. I mean, I don't do anything. <laughs> you see some of the patients I operate on. People usually don't wanna operate on them, they run their other way. Um, but I think any kind of heart surgery is, is fun. Um, and that's what I, uh, that's one of the keys, like from the last person that was talking, uh, if you do something that you really, really like, then you're going to like it. It's not going to, it's not going to be painful at all. It's just going to be fun. So I go to work and it's fun. I, I get to operate on people. People think I'm great and patients love me. It's amazing. I, I think that's, and I get paid. That's like great. Um, cardiac surgeons get paid a lot. So, uh, I know, I know the, the last speaker talked about her, her, um, exactly what she made, but we get paid a lot. Um, I mean, you get paid a lot more in, in private practice. I mean, I could probably double or triple what I get paid in private practice. There are places in Oklahoma, man, nobody wants to move to Oklahoma. Just kidding. There might be someone from Oklahoma, but in Lawton, Oklahoma that we're offering in the millions. So it's insane. Um, <clears throat> Competitive, how competitive is residence for cardiac surgery? So, um, you, so you have to get into med school. So I, I know there's usually a lot of, you, you got mo a lot of you are undergrads, I'm assuming. Um, so the key is, um, is that you have to do, it depends on when you are in your undergrad, but the key is that you do well early on. So you do well for a second year, third year, uh, uh, most of the third year, you'll be fine. 
um, you should see my grades from my fourth year at UCLA. It was terrible. Oh my God. I got into med school already. And I was just, I was just afraid that they would kick me out. <laughs> they would take away my acceptance because, you know, once you're in, you're like, Oh, forget that. Um, but it's bad to try to study for a whole semester in like a day. It's, it, it'll hurt you. So don't, don't try that. Um, I know from experience. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so yeah, so you do well in undergrad. So you just do well for a second and half of third year and then you apply because it takes a year right so you have to get a reasonable MCAT score the MCAT's a little bit different now I, I, I'd suggest that you spend time uh, take a couple months studying for it um, it's not easy and you just have to take put the time in because it's, it's just not easy um, once you get to med school what you'll find is that um, it's hard to get into med school and there's different routes and I think for me I've never been the smartest person but I kind of I'm kind of balanced I'm a balanced applicant and so uh, I'm usually like higher than mid tier of what you need to be um, for scores. And then um, I'm more of a balanced applicant. So I have almost everything in, that you need and then more than more than average of anybody that's going to get accepted. And that's what you need to do. So you have to you have to optimize your your strengths and that'll help you um, but getting so you get a med school then you go to a surgery residency a surgery residency is more competitive than medicine residency just because there's less surgery residency spots than there are medicine spots like um, to give you an example my brother is a medicine doctor and he went to the university of southern california and there were 50 something medicine internal medicine spots and there were six surgery spots so if you imagine i mean that's like you only have 10% of the spots for surgery, right? So you have to be better. I wouldn't say better, but you have to be um, academically um, competitive. How about that? Academically competitive, and that's just what it is. Um, so after you get to med school, uh, to go directly into cardiac surgery is really hard because there's only 20 something pr uh, programs in the US and each program accepts one, one resident per year. So that's 20 residents out of like, hundreds of people that want to be a cardiac surgeon so it's hard to get in um, directly to cardiac surgery some people do um, some people do general surgery first why I did general surgery first was because I didn't know if I could do cardiac surgery I mean I wanted to operate and I wanted to be amazing but I didn't know that I could do all the technical aspects because I just didn't how I how I actually became a cardiac surgeon so I did a general surgery uh, I was a fourth year I was a fourth year doing an elective in, in general, in an outside elective. So I went to the University of Southern California because I'm from LA. And the general surgery department chair was a cardiac surgeon. He was a congenital surgeon. His name is Vaughn Starnes. She's the actually the double ATS president this year, which is a, kind of a big deal. He's like, I didn't even know he knew my name. He's like, Jane, come up here. I, I was scrubbed into the case. It's like, Jane, come up here. Have you ever held the heart? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, 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 no, I've never done it. I'll do whatever you want me to do. So I was just holding the heart while he's doing his thing. And we finished the case. I don't even know what case it was. I'm a heart surgeon right now. I have no clue what case that was. And all I know is that this guy was like God. He was like walking on water. Everybody was like, oh, you're this, you're that. He never takes bad stitches he's like amazing it's like I was like man I want to be like that guy and that it, it's who you meet that kind of helps you determine who you who you want to be almost and so that's how I became a heart surgeon which is kind of dumb right it's like oh this guy's like god I want to be like him so that's kind of how that happened <clears throat> so have you heard of any advancement for long oh yeah I mean that's VADs save people transplant save people so uh, if you have heart failure if you have if you have heart failure from a a a problem that requires conventional therapy, meaning your valves are a problem like aortic stenosis, then you put in a haver, or you put it, or you change, do an AVR, an aortic valve replacement. If you have uh, coronary disease, you treat the disease process. Sometimes you have a cardiomyopathy where your heart just doesn't work and there's no etiology. Then you can do a transplant or a, uh, or a VAD. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's like a billion surgeons out there and I've gotten like emails from the most random people you can think of. Uh, everybody wants to come and see things. And usually I'm more than happy to 
I, I, there's like 200 something people on this thing, but uh, usually I'm more than happy to get, have people come to the OR. I mean, I have like speech pathology students coming to the OR and stuff. So um, there's a bunch of cardiac, uh, not there's four or five cardiac surgeons, but there's a bunch of surgeons out there that you can email. Happy to take emails. Um, if I get 200 something, there'll probably be a limit. <laughs> um, so um do you ever interact with medical oh yeah so uh, i mean i have all kinds of ideas i try to like patent all kinds of weird stuff because um uh, i think i think it's important right so even for vads i mean getting a strategy where you have a completely implantable thing and trying to get a i don't know a patent for that or or developing something where you have a prototype and i mean think about how much not that money is runs the world but it does um think about how much amazingness you could provide people and you can provide your family if, if you had something like that right so there was just one guy that developed like um uh, just a fogarty a fogarty a balloon catheter that helps thrombectomize and the guy's like a jillionaire so if you if you imagine if you develop something amazing you'd be like rolling um MBA. <clears throat> yeah. So I did a, a, a joint MD MBA program. So I finished in four, four point five years, four and a half years. Um, so my original classes was graduating, uh, graduated in May, 2009. I graduated in December, 2009. Um, I think, I think it's a great pathway. It was hard for me to want to, I thought that once I got into medicine or once I actually was doing doctor stuff, I'm not going to ever want to go back to school. And I wanted to be a little bit different. Uh, I told you I was more of a balanced applicant. I thought, I thought that would help me um, maybe transition to the next stage of life when I'm ready to get there. Um, so on paper, it'd make me more qualified. Did I learn a lot of things? I, I had some negotiations classes that were kind of cool. Um, but um, I think it's for networking. The problem with the networking part is that by the time that you actually need it, I mean, it, so I, I finished in 2009, it's 2020, I finished school in 2009, it's 2020. So I'm 11 years past when I, when I finished school and I had all those, all that networking, right? So you, you, your network changes. It's just time, time changes your network, right? <clears throat> um, very different. So a cardiologist versus a heart surgeon, the cardiologist diagnoses stuff and the surgeon operates. Um, both are very important. There's interventional cardiologists that do percutaneous interventions. And even with transcatheter valves, we work together with the interventional cardiologists, but there are different types of cardiologists. So there's interventional cardiologists, regular cardiologists, heart failure cardiologists, imaging cardiologists. So there's all kinds of cardiologists. Um, surgery residency is kind of rough. Um, it depends on what program you go to. If it was, if it was easy, it's probably not worth it almost like um so if you went to an easy program maybe you're not getting out of what you need to get out of it um so i did a lot during residency and fellowship and mainly that was driven by the fact that i was afraid that um one day i'd be the boss and i'd have a patient on the table and they would die because of me because that happens right and if you're not adequately prepared um you have seconds to think. I mean, yesterday, I'll tell you about yesterday, it's great. So this lady has um, end-stage renal disease, has a big subclavian mycotic aneurysm, and she had a, she was coated twice already on the floor. She's in the unit, intubated. So on a ton of pressors, so on a bunch of medicines that were that they need to control or get her blood pressure up. So I take her to the OR thinking, I'm just gonna evacuate this part of the field. On the table, I'm coming up from, like I told you, I did. I did a case, I did a VAD yesterday, went down to clinic, thought I was good because we finished at a great time. And then I saw that I had to go see this pericardial window lady, <clears throat> this per, this lady that was potentially dying, booked her for the OR, walking upstairs for a timeout. So you have to confirm your patient, your procedure, so you don't do brain surgery when you're supposed to do heart surgery. Um, and so um, <clears throat> I'm there, all of a sudden the pressure's 20. 20 is bad because normal is 120, um, 20 is pretty bad. So we're doing chest compressions. I'm opening up a chest that already was opened up a month ago from a surgeon from Podunk, wherever, did a surgery and like still sucks. So <laughs> we're doing chest compressions while I'm open up the chest, open up the chest, the freaking thing is bleeding like crazy. There's a big hole in the heart because the previous sternotomy wasn't, um, it wasn't fused well. And so when they did chest compressions, it basically lacerated the heart. 
So a big hole in the heart. I have to get on pump emergently and we're bleeding everywhere. We're giving products like crazy. And then we get her on pump. I fix this hole with this amazing innovative patch thing that we did. And then we get her back to the unit. And to my surprise, she's awake today, following commands and off all the medicines that are required for presser medicines. So it's kind of cool. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it was like eight or nine o'clock when I went home and my wife's like, Oh, I know that was a clinic day. So yeah, that, kind of, that part kind of sucks for her. Um, but it was really cool. I mean, and the patient probably appreciated the fact that she's alive today because she'd be dead in the unit yesterday if we didn't do anything. So, um, I think that's cool. Um, so yeah, if you want to do surgery residency, you kind of have to be passionate about it. And it, it, it seems like I, I may be passionate about it because I kind of am. Um, but if you feel like there's something else that you can do, you should do it. Because if you, if you do it, if surgery, it's like a beating like every day. It's like a beating. And it's, it's, it sounds like it's bad, but it's really, really good because it's preparing you, right? So if you're not prepared, then in instances like that, I mean, I'd be flustered and we have a dead patient, right? And the patient, it's not good for the patient, right? So um, the beatings um, continue until you get better. <laughs> so it's kind of a good thing. Um, so what specialties? I work with the cardiologist a lot. Um, sometimes infectious disease doctors because we do all these uh, endocarditis things father, doctor, fellows, colleagues, mothers. Uh, <clears throat> no, so we, uh, my wife and I got married at 25 and we had our first kid around then and we're expecting a new child um, in like a couple weeks. So different, my wife does a great job. I think you need the, like a residency program, but you need to find the right partner almost. It has to be a complementary set as opposed to the same, right? So if you're the same, you probably will butt heads a lot. If you're complementary, uh, one person will provide something the other, do other person doesn't provide. Like um, like for my son, so uh, I, I every weekend I'm not on call, I take my son to basketball, which is like I-9 basketball. And I'm, if you can tell that I'm kind of a competitive person. So I used to coach him. Um, and that was a that was a mess because I wanted to win so bad that and I couldn't I couldn't play for him so it was hard, and they said this was a couple of years ago. My wife was like, "You can't you can't yell at first graders, Eric." <laughs> so that was bad. So I didn't do that anymore. But you know, it's uh, so I still take him to basketball and I kind of watch him out there and I'm uh, you know it just like being a dad is great. I think I think. Um, I think the complimentary thing is key. Like uh, I provide a certain type of input and my wife provides um, almost a counteracting input. And by having both, you get a complete picture of what you need to be or what you should be. And I do think um, that one of the things I, I, when I'm talking to residents or med students or undergrad students or anybody doing stuff in research with me, is not, uh, or even my kids, I say, it's not my job to be your friend, right? that's not my job my, my even my kid especially is like my job is to make you into um, a really good person and that can, can contribute to the community so if you want to do research with me if you're not my kid you want to do research with me my job isn't to be your friend my job is to be, tell you to do what we want to do so we can get what we want to get out of it so we're a team right so we're not necessarily I mean I'm happy to be friends with people it's not that I'm not friendly it's just that's just what it is um Yes, I do, I do think that being like even the CEO of a hospital would be nice at some point in time. Minimally invasive procedures for cardiac surgery, it's a little bit different. I mean, there, there are more minimally invasive stuff. I mean, I had a lot of experience with a robot. Everybody's fascinated with the stupid robot. It's called the Da Vinci. It just has arms and it does whatever you want it to do. Um, it, the visualization is better because it's 3D visualization, but some heart surgeries you can't do with a robot. I mean, there's only specific things you can do with the robot. Um, my surgery residency, I mean, I'm telling you, it was beat down. I mean, they, they were beating me down pretty hard. And it was almost as if I had to, like, switch it up to beat them down <laughs> before I got any, you know, it, it's just what it is. Like, this is it's a complete beat down. And once you think, once you're good enough, all of a sudden, like, you can hold your own. And, and that's 
what's necessary and it is what's necessary right so if you people if you see people that especially in a surgery residency or surgery a surgeon like if you if you're unable to make decisions people are going to die and that's bad right i mean sometimes being okay isn't good enough it's just not i mean but there are okay people that they finish surgery residencies and just in my opinion that's not that's not a good thing for patient care um, special characteristics. I think, I think everybody's very different. Um, so I finished my, so I finished general surgery in 2015 and I finished uh, cardiac surgery in 2018. And so this is my second, third year, it was my third year of being an attending and even evaluating the fellows we have, everybody's a little bit different. You don't, you don't need the same, like even, I, I don't know if you noticed this, when you write personal statements or you've seen see people write personal statements, they can be great and they can be very different. Um, so I think you just bring your, your own picture, your own characteristics to the, to the ball game. And there's many ways to achieve the same goal. I think my wife is the key to that equation, and I'm not just saying that because she's in the other room. <laughs> Could be, just kidding. Um, it, she really is. I, I think uh, she provides everything that I don't provide because, and I think that, again, that's where the partnerships that you make, even if, I mean, I have research partners that, uh, like PhD research partners, you just, you have to find the right partner for what you need. So if it's a relationship, you have to find the right partner. If you don't have the right partner, you're going to be sad because if she was, and sometimes she probably is, if she was pissed every day that I was at work, um, that would be bad. It would be hard on us, right? If I'm having a hard day at work and have to come home and have to be, have a hard day at home, you don't want to kill yourself soon. That's just, it's not to make light of that, but that's just what it is. Uh, someone interested in the field of cardiology, would you say cardiac surgeon? Um, Sean, I think uh, it's a loaded question because there could be cardiologists out there. Um, I think that, um, yes, I think a cardiac surgeon can do everything a cardiologist can do. Am I as good as a cardiologist as reading echoes? No, but you can learn that. I mean, that's just not, that's a skill, right? Um, but I can do everything, theoretically, it's theoretically, right? I can do everything they can do, but more. Right, I, I, I don't PCI, I don't put stents in people. Um, that's a different skill set. But I mean, I, I do every open operation known to man. I mean, I can operate on someone's appendix if I wanted to right now. I right? just being a general surgeon, but I, I don't because I don't want to touch the guts. Um, so, so, I think cardiac surgery is amazing. There's almost nothing that can compare to it. Actually, when I, I'll tell you a story. When I was a um, and we have a couple minutes left. Uh, when I was a general surgery resident um, and I got into cardiac surgery, um, I got into cardiac surgery, some of the attendings were like, or someone's like, it's not like it's neurosurgery. <laughs> Pissed, right? It's like irritated. So I went into, uh, I was on trauma. I went to go scrub in with a neurosurgeon and a patient that had a, that came in as a trauma. They just made a hole in the, the head and made bleeding stuff. I'm like, dude, this is not hard at all. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think cardiac surgery is there's no comparison. Um, again, I may be biased, and there are other amazing fields out there, and you need somebody that does everything. So they're, they're, I have some of the, my best friends are like psychiatrists and stuff, and the craziest story they told me was that you know psychiatry is like cardiac surgery. <laughs> I was like, drove me nuts, but this is what it is. Um, investment banking no i don't i think cardiac surgery is the best thing that i could have done um, i didn't know at the time it just was it was and also to, between 2005 and 2008 or 9 i mean there's like a crazy crazy crash in like real estate and stocks and all that stuff so i would have been a very poor person bum on the street um i think i have a fair balance Again, I, and my wife contributes amazingly to it. Heart attacks, misdiagnosed, tingling. Women have um, uh, different symptoms than men. They, they have less, oh, sorry, that was a direct message. I should direct message that person. Um, um, life, just in general with heart attacks, you have to stop smoking, um, try to, try to eat better um, and 
try not to, um, you should see your doctor and then they should optimize your medical regimen. And so um, those are the things to prevent stuff like that. Memorable case. I mean, yesterday was pretty crazy, but I mean, I've, one of my most memorable cases was like the worst case. I was in the OR for 23 hours. We had a patient on ECMO and we put in a heart transplant and we're bleeding the whole time. That one will live with me forever. 23 hours. Think about that. I was the fellow, the attending, we finished sewing the graft, we finished sewing the heart in, the attending was in the, um, was in the lounge and I was there sitting there watching bleeding for 23 hours of my life. <laughs> that was rough. Um, what watch am I wearing? Um, uh, just the watch. I don't know. Uh, what? Um, I wish it was a Rolex. If you want to gift me one, that'd be great. Uh, background in engineering, done coronary disease medical devices. Yeah, you can email me um, anytime. I'm happy to take emails. Again, if 200 emails come up, there's going to be a limit to that equation. Uh, there are probably somewhere in the order of 10 or 12 people that are already working with me and doing stuff. Um, I'm happy to help direct you toward a project if that's what you want. Um, you can come and watch us operate. Um, there's other cardiac surgeons and everybody's nice. Everybody does a great job. And so um, I'm happy to um, facilitate that. Uh, you can email me. Yeah, thanks for speaking. Um, if anyone wants to email me and then I could like send them to you if that works better so you don't get like flooded with emails, however yeah, you want to do that. However, however you think is best is amazing. Okay, yeah, I just don't want you flooded with emails. I'll take the flood of emails. 200 seems like a lot. <laughs> I don't surprised. think that many people will email, but <laughs> all okay. right, thank you for speaking today. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Happy to help anytime. Thank you.